Yesterday, in a Detroit courtroom, John DeLorean pleaded not guilty to swindling company investors out of $9 million. This is the continuing saga of a man whose name alone conjures up visions of the wealthy and glamorous, as well as images of a sleek stainless steel sports car bearing the DeLorean name. But the most indelible impression the public has of John DeLorean is that of maverick automotive genius, who, desperate to save his failing car company, became involved in what he alleges was a government-engineered cocaine deal. The nation watched as he was found not guilty in the most celebrated drug trafficking trial ever. But the story doesn't end here. A few days after the verdict was announced, the picture-perfect marriage of John DeLorean to model Christina Farrar came to an end. From media accounts, we are well aware of the recent events in John DeLorean's life, but most of us know very little about, he came, about how he came to power and became such an infamous public figure as he is today. He left General Motors Corporation, and with that, he gave up a very private life that was soon to become a very public life. Here with us to tell his story is John DeLorean, who has just completed his book entitled DeLorean. Good morning to you, John. So you two had an interesting evening. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. I don't remember. There it. <laughs> is so much to know about your life in order to do this. Born in Detroit, your father was in the industry. Were you destined, do you suppose, from day one to become a part of the industry? Well, you know, my dad was a factory worker and a, really a labor organizer back in the early days of unionism in the automobile industry. But uh, I think when you are born and raised in Detroit, it's either you become part of the industry or you move away. You know, it's a one industry town. In your 17 some years at General Motors, what kinds of innovations do you take credit for? Well, I don't know about taking credit. A lot of the things that I worked on are parts of cars today. You know, the, uh, for example, the frames used in most of the major cars, a lot of the, uh, the concealed windshield wipers, uh, a lot of the fabrication techniques, a lot of the safety improvements. And minority involvement? We have had a, did a tremendous amount of work in minority involvement. I put in the first black dealer in uh, Watts. In fact, I ran into his widow. Uh, he died uh, some time back, and it was really amazing, his uh, daughter, and, and uh, she remembered me very well. You blast General Motors. Uh, Not really. Uh, well, you say that they're shallow in their policy making, that they had no forward thinking uh, or planning, and that your job had no substance, that you really found you were more of a paper pusher. Why, in light of some of those things, did you stay all those years? No, I, uh, I think what happened is that while I ran a division, that was like being a the quarterback of the Patriots except last weekend <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was fun it was a challenge every day it was exciting uh, the interesting thing about the automobile industry is that in a town like Detroit you know who your competition is and every 10 days you see how you're doing in comparison to them you know or you know what's Iacocca doing to you today or what are you doing to him so it's a really intense sense of competition and the whole organization feels it it's a very healthy thing let me ask you a <coughs> question, all right? <laughs> I knew this was going well, to happen. Well, <laughs> in a way it sounds like, in a way, like you were set up to be pushed out of General Motors. And, and let me tell you why, at least from what I've read. There were uh, various people for a variety of reasons. Roger Keyes, who was your boss when you were running Pontiac Chevrolet. Keyes, yeah. Roger Keyes. He didn't like your dress, your way of dress. He didn't, he thought you were a womanizer. Richard Terrell, who succeeded Keyes, uh, said, quote to you, John, disappear into the boondocks. Um, then you gave this speech at the Greenbrier on product quality, and it was leaked by the PR department. You say it was the rough draft. It pretty much blasted General Motors. And that was kind of the end for you. Was it true that no well, one you liked are... you there, John, that you were not <coughs> oh, a popular man? No, I think, man? no, I think I got along with most of the people pretty well, although there were a few. You know, everybody in every organization has uh, you know, some people on your side and some against. I've always gotten along very well with my uh, peers and the people who worked under me. I've always had a certain amount of problems and confrontations with my bosses. That's been the nature of my life. But your resignation was drawn by General Motors. Is that unusual for a man who intends to resign? Were, was it a resignation or were you in fact asked to leave? No, no, I, I left. I, I tendered my resignation almost immediately after I was promoted and given a tremendous bonus. I moved up from uh, the head of Chevrolet to the group executive of North American Car and Truck Operations. And I did that about a month, spending every minute and sitting in a committee meeting, listening to the same people say the same things. And I said, I just can't imagine doing this for 18 more years. I can't, I couldn't possibly survive. But just so, bottom line, weren't you dissatisfied? <coughs> There's been so much in print about your criticism of GM. Can I just ask you? Do you criticize the company? No, no, I owe everything uh, I have in the world to General Motors. And what I, when I did the book, I was trying to be constructive, and that's the reason that the author and I had a 
problem. You know, he, he printed the book without my permission. On a clear day. Yeah, and then we had a contract. He was supposed to pay me half of what he got. I think he's made about a million and a half bucks. He's never given me a penny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but John, uh, as they say in the automobile industry, let's shift gears here. We've heard a lot about your automotive career, which has been very successful for the most part. But a lot of people are interested in, and intrigued by your personal life and your image and lifestyle. And one of the corporate grains, I guess, that you cut against there at GM was that you liked younger women, beautiful women, you were flamboyant, you dyed your hair, you lost weight, you had cosmetic surgery. Are any of these things true? Well, some of them are true. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, I, I uh, have liked uh, attractive women, and uh, now I'm reformed. I like ugly women. <laughs> 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 but no, seriously, did you? Did I like you? ugly women, slow cars, and bad food now. <laughs> <laughs> Got that line down, Pat, out of you? No, not but really. Did, but did you have, John, and I don't want to sound like we're, we're interrogating you here, because uh, you've already had that experience with the best, but did you have a nose job? Did you have your face lifted? No, I had my, f my nose busted about five times when I played basketball, and I, I didn't have a nose job, but I had it straightened, and... Uh, and I had to have some, I had uh, a little work. Uh, back when I was a kid, I had a, a, a serious injury to my jaw, and I had a piece of impacted bone, which had to be removed about 18 or 19 years ago. And I had such a horrible experience that, uh, when that happened that I've really never felt uh, you know, mm. impelled to go back and have it straightened out. And of course, my face is about half scar tissue now. Well, it looks okay from here. Yeah. <laughs> but it's going to so last the rest of my life, anyhow. <laughs> That's true. The other thing that intrigued me about you was that you said you preferred a certain kind of woman, a woman that was very attractive, non-threatening, non-challenging, and any woman that was intelligent threatened you. Do you still feel that way? No, I, I think I realized that that was a mistake and that uh, somehow, uh, psychologically, I've been trying to readjust myself to understand why I felt that, because certainly I met a lot of uh, very uh, intelligent, intriguing women, and I guess I always felt somewhat intimidated by them. And so, uh, you know, today I have a different attitude. No. Although, you know, it's, I'm going to lose my reputation as a <laughs> womanizer if I don't get a date pretty soon. It's been a year and two months. Well, that was the other thing about the GM <coughs> detractors. They said that you were indeed a womanizer. You liked a, women who are a great deal younger than yourself, um, Liz, Kelly. I think Kelly Harmon, the daughter of Tom Harmon, she was, what, about 19 No, she's about old? 22. In fact, I just saw her on the street the other day. We but how much younger is she than you? Uh, about 24 years. What was the reaction at GM? Uh, uh, it was pretty, uh, although the president at that time, Ed Cole's wife, was 25 years younger than him, and my boss. The that's Dolly Cole, right? Yeah, and, uh, and uh, Pete Estes, who was my immediate boss's wife, was 24 years younger. So I think that that was not unusual. You said something in the Playboy magazine interview that I saw where a friend of yours said, do we love you and we hate you? While they're jumping into bed with their ugly wives, you're going to bed with someone. I was a PR director at Chevy. Said that you know one of the problems. I, and I, you know I never thought much about. I've never concerned myself much about what other people think. Anyhow. Really, John, I can't believe that. That's true. Changing your image. You're you're in an image business, the automobile business. You don't care what other people think. <clears throat> well, certainly that's much more true now even than it was then. But I've always sort of you know, believe that if you live your life the way you should and do the things that you believe are correct, that everything ultimately will turn out. That I still believe that. you're a maverick. Then you really are a maverick, aren't you? Uh, well, I get, uh, even today, I wind up in, uh, for example, I'm so depressed by what I see going on in South Africa. It drives me insane. But, uh, and those things bother me. I'm just made that way, that's all. I met her through the, uh, my divorce attorney, as a matter of fact, <laughs> who had handled her divorce. That's how we met. What about the Christianity? You're born again. A lot of people say that's what they all say. They go to jail and they come out and they're born again. It's a cop out. It's part of John DeLorean's new image he's created for himself. Well, I don't know that, uh, uh, of course, no true Christian would say that because that's part of being a Christian. On the other hand, it's not unusual. You know, throughout the Bible, most of the conversions happened under times of great duress because when your life is going perfectly and there's no problem, you have no tendency to, to uh, seek solutions, and particularly those from, uh, from Christ. Although today, Christ is the most important factor in my life. And, and I don't care what people think about that. It's between me and him. But you do understand that people feel that way. I mean, I even <coughs> Chuck Colson, you talk about Chuck Colson in the, the Playboy interview. Mm -hmm. So you know he's an example that's been compared to you. 
Well, well Carlson, I think, is, uh, of course, uh, you know, they, everybody said this is a fake conversion, and it's turned out now. I think he's finally worn them all down just over a period of time. But it's also true, in my opinion, that he's an infinitely more relevant human being today than he was when he was the power behind the president. Mm -hmm. The suicide. When did you think about suicide? Well, I uh, went through a period of, you know, feeling pretty morbid about it. My real concern was the family, the thought of uh, going through years and years more of the same aggravation. You know, it's clear that the government's not going to let up on me, that if uh, when we win the case in Detroit now, I'm sure they'll come back and back and back until I'm dead. Now, Christina brought you the Bible, you said, <coughs> yes. to, the, to the jail. And that's when you pretty much became born again. Well, what happened was, uh, 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 for some reason, I couldn't quit reading it. I read it from the break of day till late at night. And one of the guards was a, a seminary student. He spent a lot of time with me, uh, helped me, talked about Jesus a lot. And then eventually, I had my experience there in prison. And it was marvelous. What was it, it just a, a moment you thought of suicide? You didn't really contemplate <coughs> it for well, a Well, I wasn't time. thinking about it that in prison at all. But what uh, about the effect on your children? And the one thing that interested me in reading your book, John, is how are your children? Now, you talk about what a Christian would say or not say. How are your kids, Zachary and Catherine, going to feel about you when they read the things you say about Christina in the book? Well, I don't think I treat her uh, uh, badly. I mean, you know, truth is a truth is a truth. <laughs> and I try to be perfectly candid, really, about everything. You know, I've told parts of my life, but I mean, it really warts yeah, and all. But we, the public, need to know that, John, about Christina's so-called attitude and ambitions and how she fainted in court and later on said, see, you said I wasn't a good actress, I fooled you. I mean, is that... Well, I, as I said, I just try to be absolutely honest about everything. I felt it was important because the story is the story. I'm interested in your third child, your dream to fulfill this, this lifelong dream of yours to have your, <coughs> own, your own company. So you go to... Uh, Europe. And is it true that McKinsey, brought him as consultant by the Brit Brits, said absolutely not feasible, it probably won't work. But a man named Roger Mason, who was Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, ultimately put up $77 million to start DeLorean Car Company. What went wrong, John? Well, most of those facts that you just said are wrong. <laughs> but we went to uh, Northern, we, you know, obviously I'd had this dream, I wanted to build this uh, automobile company. Uh, we went to Belfast because no one else would have us in the world. Everybody said it's inconceivable that in today's day that any new automobile company could survive. It's not possible. Who did give you the money? So we went to Belfast because nobody else would go to Belfast. You know, Belfast is a, the, right. the worst. Right. You tried Puerto Rico first, didn't you? We went through a whole series of alternatives, and ultimately none of them worked until we went up there. And the reason they gave us uh, financial support was that they put us in a battlefield between major Catholic and Protestant developments, mm -hmm. and remarkably, and this is the one real tragedy of that whole thing, is we built a successful company in 1981, the only year we were in business, we made, I think, like $27 million in the last half of the year, the only profitable motor company in Great Britain. Did the Brit British people, British government give you the money? <coughs> what happened is, under the conservative government, we started the project under, not Roger, but Roy mm -hmm. Mason, who was the Secretary of State under the conservative government, when the, I mean, uh, the labor government, when the conservatives were elected, they decided not to honor the contract mm -hmm. signed by labor. Just like the, remember when uh, President Carter was in, they started building all those missile sites in Utah and Nevada. When the Reagan administration mm -hmm. came in, they changed their mind. They still own so all So you didn't farm. get $77 million? Oh, we got m much more than that. But we never got the last part of the contract, which was $93 million under the Working Capital Clause, and that put us out of business. When was that? Well, when was When what? were you supposed to get the $97 million? When we opened the factory. Which was? Well, we started in production in about March of 1981. Then, um, financial arrangement to try to bail out the company. When well, we, uh, when I knew they weren't going to honor their contract, and that's where my own ego got in my way, because when that happened, anybody who had intelligence would have said, hey, if they don't want it to live, it's not going to live. You but why wouldn't they want it out. to live when ultimately they did because it in the first place to a, stimulate employment? But it was a different government. It says, I just went But don't they that. still want to stimulate government <coughs> in Belfast? No, I mean, they've been selling off and closing all the businesses up there. Many of the big, er, almost every business in Belfast has been closed. All right, the involvement with cocaine. Talk about that. 
Why did it happen? You say it well, was Well, it's a peculiar thing because, you know, in my life, I have never, even to this day, with the exception of that one suitcase they threw in front of me, and I'm not even sure what that was, but I've never ever seen cocaine, touched cocaine, used cocaine, or been in the presence of anybody who's ever used it. I mean, that's just not the, you know, the, the social group that we went with are basically wine and cocktail drinkers and they don't, they just don't use cocaine. But you say they didn't tell you it was <coughs> cocaine, they just said that they had an arrangement and that you suddenly thought you were involved with the mob and you were frightened for your life well, and I your could, children's lives. Uh, really what happened is that when the government, the great British, uh, the, the conservative government elected not to live up to their contract, I knew I was in financial trouble and I talked to everybody anywhere, in you know, any Arab that came along, anybody who had the potential to try to save our company because as I said my ego got in the way I said this my name is on this I'm not gonna let it die well then I got a call from a man in California who turned out later to be a government informant who'd been given three hundred and sixty thousand dollars tax-free for what he did and uh, he he said he had investors he gave me a bank reference one of the largest banks in California I talked to the president the president of the bank said yes this man has an eight-figure deposit mm -hmm. which is more than ten million dollars and he has good credit with us and if he says it we'll be glad to help finance other parts of your company well that's the guy I started dealing with among 50 others but simultaneously well then suddenly about two months later he mentioned the subject of narcotics I tried to escape and I could what do you mean you tried to escape well the when they mentioned it I said, well, you know, I don't have the money now. I can't, you know, in other words, this commission arrangement, I just tried to get, to get out of it. When I got out of the room, I called my attorneys in New York, and I said, I think I've stumbled into a, into a nest of organized crime. And I described the fact that suddenly what had started as a legitimate transaction was turning into an illegal one. And yet, uh, you've been asked this many times, on that <coughs> tape, you look relaxed, you're laughing, you're toasting. You say well, people who really know you would know that's not the real John yeah, DeLorean. Of course. Well, I was, uh, do, now the attorneys advised me three things. They said, first, don't confront them, go along with them, because at this point, the alternatives are that or they'll probably kill you. Mm -hmm. Number two, don't make any kind of a deal with them, don't take any money, don't give them any money, and don't enter into any agreement, which is what I did. And of course, that's what the jury found. Now, that tape you have to talk about, that was totally orchestrated because the prosecutor had decided I had not committed any illegal act and he had no chance unless they could somehow get me on tape with, uh, you know, with some cocaine. So they, they demanded that I come to California on the threat of my children's lives. And when I got, and I thought I was dead. Mm -hmm. That's why I wrote a letter to my attorneys before I left. And I said, look at in the event of my death, this should be opened. And this tells all the people and what they've done. Just a final question in this segment. You say that you feel in the bottom of your heart. I've read you said this, all right, that you say that General Motors might have been with the, with the United States government, the FBI, and even the English government in cahoots, that they were threatened by the DeLorean success being a threat to Corvette. You feel they were all in cahoots together, and that's why this whole thing happened. No, I think what is absolutely clear is that the British and the and the U.S. government worked together because, for example, during the times uh, of this of this sting operation, uh, I had a contract with the British and it expired and they kept extending it and they extended it four times and each time they extended it, it coincided exactly with the meeting with the fake banker and the But informant. what I don't understand in closing in this segment, and we'll come back with more, what I don't understand is why would the British government uh, on purpose put egg on their face? Because it is egg on their face. They closed a plant that gave employment to people in Northern Ireland. Why would they fall prey to what the United States wanted, what you say the United States wanted? No, no, I think that the British had made up their mind not to see they've been selling off all the government-owned businesses. They've sold off, they're selling off British Leyland, British Airways, British mm -hmm. Petroleum, British Steel. And they had elected not to f not to do any more industrial development, and that's the reason they would not honor the balance of our contracts. Because I think I'm essentially uh, irrelevant. <laughs> I really can't imagine that that uh, so many people could be interested. Well, in, uh, maybe irrelevant, but not boring. Two technicalities: the technicality of your acquittal. You did not testify in your own defense, yet you got an acquittal. Can well, you what, that? yeah, what happened is that almost from the very beginning of their case, the, the government frame-up became clear. The first uh, witness who testified was an FBI agent who was caught not only destroying valuable evidence, but fabricating new evidence. 
And then it turned out later that uh, the prosecutor and the informant had perjured themselves 31 times, that the, uh, every other agent was caught either backdating documents mm -hmm. or faking evidence, that tapes had been modified and changed. They, so they broke into houses and stole, you know, everything. So their case collapsed, in So but by the time uh, we got, and then a, a miracle happened in that one of the case agents on the case had gotten so offended by the gross injustice that he resigned and and he came and he decided to testify for us. Mm -hmm. And he told the whole story. He said the prosecutor one night got drunk with $400 mm -hmm. worth of taxpayers' money. He stood up and he said, I'm going to be on a cover of Time magazine for nailing for this doing. guy. The and technicality of your divorce, but before that, before I ask you, are you really divorced? Were you shocked that she divorced you two weeks after the trial? We saw her standing by you, looking very chic all the time, and then suddenly we read in the papers that she's divorcing you. Yeah, I was really shocked. In fact, uh, after going through the whole trial, uh, you know, which I think I survived rather well, uh, I went into a fit of horrible depression. I think I lost mm -hmm. about 35 pounds in three Have you months. Seen her since? And, oh, yeah. Are you really divorced? Because I know yeah, she's we're, remarried we're to an ABC executive, but <coughs> there was some technicality about venue well, in California, New Jersey. Yeah, actually, what the uh, judge in New Jersey found was that her California divorce was not uh, valid because she had uh, misrepresented her residency, and so uh, he found that she, they were, that she and I were her. still married. Oh no. She and I were still married, and that her new marriage is not valid, but you know, that's, those are moot technical mm -hmm. points. You face uh, the indictments in Detroit, and I know you can't talk about those. But I, I can was talk on, a little bit about it. Are you going to take the, tr the stand in your own defense in this trial? Oh, or I do believe you know? so. You think you will? Yes. I was on the phone this morning at 6 o'clock with the London Observer, and they told me something. They said that after this, that there have been fraud charges brought in Geneva for $17.5 million that was paid to GPD, a company set up that it's claimed was a Panamanian company with a Swiss account that was used to bring money back for your own personal use. Uh, Colin Chapman, who was head of Lotus, has died of a heart attack. I guess that further that complicated things because he, had, he was part of GPD. Uh, you're aware, obviously, of these fraud charges. Are you involved in them? Will you then go to Geneva to face fraud <coughs> charges? Well, no, the first, you're telling me the, something that I had never heard before. I never heard of anything over there. But I have to say this that first all of these allegations had been previously investigated by Scotland Yard and we have documents from them saying that there's absolutely no basis in them. Number two, when I was acquitted in California after this horrible embarrassment that the Department of Justice uh, uh, suffered, uh, I was told by many, many people, including agents, that they're not going to quit. In fact, an agent got on a phone interview last night on radio and said, said, you know, when you win this, that isn't going to be the end of it. They're going to keep coming after you. But is it coincidental with your book and coming out that uh, they're bringing this up at the same time? <coughs> well, it, what's really peculiar is that grand jury is in its third year, and suddenly, the week my book comes out, and I start the book tour so that, of course, people like you can try to humiliate me oh, about no, this subject, Joe, it suddenly comes up, which is completely illogical. But I will say this. Uh, first, we expect to prove unequivocally that every single penny was honestly and legitimately come by. Number two, that all these charges are absolutely and totally false. And, and you know, and uh, finally, uh, uh, when you get all through with it, uh, uh, hopefully somewhere down the line they'll leave me alone and let me have a little You please. have a new car coming out. You were quoted in Playboy as saying, I think there were a lot of things I did wrong. I think my ultimate sin and it was really terrible was that I had this insatiable pride. I really was insane. Looking back, I see that I only had arrogance beyond that of other, any other human being alive. Will you do it differently this time, John? Yeah, I think I'm a different person now, this experience. The, the horror of it has been one thing. It's destroyed my life, my family, my company, and my what my good name and everything else. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, uh, having found Christ, I really am a different individual, and I believe that I'm going to be a very different person in the way I conduct all of my affairs. So you don't think 60 is too late? No, I don't think so. Will this I new automobile be handled this whole, well, where will it be built? <clears throat> well, uh, we're in the process now. Uh, the parts are all in Columbus, Ohio. The cars are ready to be assembled, and a man down there has made us a very attractive arrangement in which he will finance the components right to the back door of the factory until they're sold. So it's a really easy deal. There's a movie, there's very a attractive, picture, there's a very attractive offer being made for the movie rights to your book. Uh, a less serious, less heavy question, John. Who do you want to play John DeLorean? I don't know. I haven't thought about that very much. 
I don't know. Uh, it's hard to tell. I don't think I'd be a good judge of who should play me. Oh, I got a few people in mind. Do you, do, you think that, do you think that John DeLorean of the future will find some happiness and maybe a sense of internal peace that you haven't had for quite a while now? Well, I tell you, what shakes you up right now is that, of course, uh, the only re the, the only time I really find peace is, of course, I'm like I'm going to L.A. this weekend, and of course, when my two kids hug me and our our little sheep dog jumps up and licks your face, suddenly you forget all of the mm. other things in the world. But I, I pray that someday I will have some peace and that my children can have some. Well, John, we really hope that for you, too. For better or for worse, whether you're right or wrong, we're not the ones to judge you. So this is like John's you. new book. It is called DeLorean. It is his explanation of all that he has gone through, and I promise you it is fascinating reading.